Excellencies, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this very important session on climate adaptation for resilience at the 2021 Davos Agenda. My name is Dominic Warre. I'm a managing director here at the World Economic Forum, and I'm really looking forward to moderating our discussion today. Let me start by saying that this is a truly unique session as we're co-hosting it with the government of the Netherlands as the official closing session of the 2021 Climate Adaptation Summit, which was a 24 hour live streamed event focused on scaling up global cooperation and leadership for a climate resilient future. So congratulations to all of you over in the Netherlands. The summit was a fantastic success. I'm sure you saw some of it in the press and has demonstrated great momentum from several heads of state, ministers, business and civil society leaders on what we need to do to radically step up our adaptation actions. We look forward to hearing more from the moderator, Sasha de Boer, um, later on in this discussion. Um, but let me say a few words of uh, introduction to start with. As many of you know, listening in, 2021 is a critical year for climate action. The COVID pandemic has created a new reality, presenting us with both opportunities and risks. The opportunity for a great reset and creating more resilient, equitable and climate smart societies, but also the risk of locking in climate, tipi climate tipping points threatening our planet, planetary stability. The 2021 Global Risk Report from the World Economic Forum identifies climate action failure and extreme weather events as the most likely long-term risks we face over the next decade. And just for a few weeks ago, the World Meteorological Organization announced that 2020 is on track to be the joint hottest year on record uh, with 2016, and jointly, um, if not firstly, the most hottest decade, 2010 through 2020. So it's obvious we're not keeping pace with the scale and impact of the climate crisis. We need to raise ambition, and more importantly, we need to translate that ambition into action. That's why here at the World Economic Forum, our executive chairman and founder, Professor Klaus Schwab, uh, announced one year ago at our annual meeting in Davos 2020, a net zero challenge, asking forum members to radically step up their targets to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. And we're now working with several alliances to help us achieve our vision. The CEO Climate Leaders Alliance, which represents over 85 companies, and the International Business Council with 122 companies globally who will be implementing some ESG metrics. In addition, through initiatives like our Mission Possible Partnership, we're working directly with heavy industries to help key sectors decarbonize um, in what are so-called hard to abate areas like aviation and shipping. Since its launch at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019, this initiative, the Mission Possible Partnership, has grown from 30 to over 400 companies. And with a great partnership with others, we're all working with the UN-led processes to deliver sector-specific decarbonisation outcomes to unlock finance, technologies, and policy solutions that will accelerate the transition and promote the race to zero. So through these initiatives, we are working closely with the COP presidency, uh, both 25 and the presidency uh, designate, COP26, and the COP high-level champions in the lead-up to the important meeting in Glasgow at the end of the year. So I'm delighted that we have the COP26 president, Alok Sharma, with us today, and we look forward to discussing how we can deliver high climate ambition outcomes at Glasgow. So we can do this, but we can't do it alone. And that's why we're going to move to hear from the panel about how the Climate Adaptation Summit went. Um, and then we'll hear from the host of that summit later on in the discussion. So, with no further ado, um, we'll turn to our panel discussion. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our panelists uh, to this uh, uh, discussion. We have a great uh, panel for you. And I also want to flag to the audience that after the panel presentations, we will have an interactive question and answer session if we have time. So on your Slido, you can submit questions directly. It's very easy. You can simply scan the QR code to submit your questions. So let's get on um, and meet uh, the panel. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, our panelists. Uh, we have 
in uh, no particular order of esteemed capabilities and fame, um, the uh, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, uh, Professor Pateri Talas. Welcome, sir. Fika Sibesma, the Honorary Chairman of Royal DSM, which is a leading Dutch company and a global commissioner on adaptation, and, may I say, an Honorary Chair and founder of the CEO Climate Leaders Alliance I mentioned earlier. Welcome, sir. Uh, Rebecca Marmot, the Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever, an incredible leader at an incredible company at the forefront of corporate action on climate and social issues. Welcome, Rebecca. And I'm also delighted, as I mentioned, to welcome to the discussion the Right Honourable Alok Sharma, COP26 President um, from the United Kingdom, the person in charge of the 2021 climate meeting in Glasgow. Welcome, sir. It's delightful to have you, given how much you have on your agenda. I'm also delighted to say that a little bit later in the conversation, we'll be joined by uh, Mr. Shinjuro Koizumi, who's the Minister of Environment of Japan. Japan, as you know, recently announced a national net zero target commitment. So let's get going with the discussion. You see the QR code on your screen if you want to ask any questions as we uh, discuss. Professor Tallis, if I could start with you. Um, the statistics that uh, you and your organization have put out about uh, 2020 are quite incredible. Joint hottest year ever, uh, the end of the joint hottest decade ever, uh, fires in the Arctic, let alone California and Australia, floods in Asia, heat waves in the ocean, 29 tropical storms across the Atlantic, so many that we ran out of alphabet letters. Um, you must be quite concerned, to say the least, as the leading scientific organization in this space. And I guess the question is, how do we better prepare and adapt for the events that we are seeing if more is to come? And specifically, what are you looking for this year in the run-up to the COP summit uh, for actors, both from the public and private sector, to do? Over to you, sir. Thanks for the invitation to address you. And uh, I'd like to thank also the government of Netherlands for hosting excellent uh, Global Adaptation Summit yesterday, which I also had a chance to participate in. As, uh, as, as, as you said, uh, climate change is only very visible. We have uh, reached 1.2 degree warming so far, and there's 24 percent probability that we would reach uh, 1.5, the low limit of Paris Agreement uh, during the coming five years. We have stored lots of extra heat to the oceans, and, uh, and we are breaking records there year by year. And also the same is true for, for the main greenhouse gases uh, like uh, carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, year by year, we are breaking new records. And we have started seeing growing amount of uh, disasters, uh, growing amount of economic losses, and uh, big impact on human welfare worldwide. Mitigation is, of course, very essential. Uh, it's, we have heard encouraging news from European Union, China, USA, Japan, South Korea, and South Africa. But uh, it's time to go from political promises to concrete action. So what finally matters is what happens in the, in the real atmosphere. And so far, we haven't anything positive to report about that. The negative trend in climate will continue until 2060s and, and sea level rise until uh, next uh, century. And, uh, and, and that happens despite of the success of implementation of Paris Agreement. This means that we have to pay much more attention to climate uh, adaptation. And one of the very powerful ways to adapt to climate change is to invest in early warning services. Today, only 40% of, of our 193 members have proper early warning services. And, and also the, the basis of early warning services, uh, the global observing system is in fairly poor shape. We have uh, poor observing systems of weather, climate, and water, especially in Africa, uh, Caribbean, Pacific Islands, and, and also some parts of uh, Latin America. That means that the accuracy of the forecasts in those regions especially is poor, and it's having a negative impact on the quality of uh, forecasts worldwide, also in developed uh, world. That's why we have created the three major initiatives to improve the situation. We have already cruise initiative ongoing, which was initiated by the government of France, and we have now eight uh, contributing countries, and Finland just uh, announced, uh, announced yesterday that they are joining this initiative. This is uh, supporting the further development of uh, multi-asset early warning services with impacts. So that's important. 
And then we have to improve our observing systems, and that's why we have created uh, systematic observation financing facility, SOF, uh, and we need uh, 400 million US dollars to improve the situation, uh, especially in Africa, six countries, and uh, some Latin American countries. And thirdly, uh, we are also working to build the water climate uh, accelerator to improve the implementation of sustainable development goal six. Uh, uh, we, are not, we don't have proper uh, ways to control the water resources uh, to cope with the drought and, uh, and flooding. And we have uh, 10 UN agencies behind this initiative and several governments at uh, the heads of state and minister level. And uh, this is a, in, in a subset of uh, United Nations water. So to conclude, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we, we have to pay attention to adaptation and, and mitigation. And from WMO's side, we are happy to, happy to be part of the game. Thank you. Secretary General, thank you so much. And it's very heartening to hear about the amount of effort and collaboration internationally that's occurring in early warning systems to get us ready for this future. If I can turn to you, Fakka uh, Sabesma, you're a commissioner on the uh, Global Adaptation uh, Commission, and you were involved in the summit yesterday along with colleagues on this, uh, on this session. Um, what were the key messages coming out of the Commission? And moving forward, what needs to happen next? Uh, thank you, Dominic, and great for organizing uh, this. Uh, two years ago, we started with the Global Commission on Climate Adaptation. It was mentioned in the Paris Treaty, but not so strong. It was mainly in the Paris Treaty where we got our climate approach uh, on mitigation. As we all know, unfortunately, we are not on track on achieving our Paris goals, so we hard, uh, work harder on mitigation. And in the meantime, the impact on climate change is growing, especially for the developing countries where we realize it's a fact of every single day. And therefore we started with this global uh, commission on adaptation. We set up also the global center uh, for climate adaptation, co-chaired by Mr. Ban Ki-moon and, and myself. What we do there is uh, developing best practices uh, for resilient food production uh, in terms of drought and how can we produce our food when, when it's too dry or too wet, or how can we protect infrastructure uh, in the West, but also in the South, so to say, or cities uh, or water, et cetera. And those best practices which we develop can be rolled out. We do that also with the African Development Bank uh, in the different uh, countries. It's not only for the public sector, also for the private sector who need to join, to be honest, also in their own interest uh, to protect their own supply chains. But also since we figured out that climate adaptation and investing in that can take care of another 0.7% uh, extra economic growth in terms of GDP globally and provide millions of jobs. So uh, what we said yesterday is we need adaptation next to mitigation. Uh, and we need to work on that from the public and the private sector on both, hand in hand, because climate change is a reality today. Today, globally, Dominic, we spent about 30 billion. Uh, if I take all companies and all governments, et cetera, globally all together, uh, went down a little bit over the last year, uh, and it needs to increase with a factor of 10 uh, over the coming years in order to fulfill our ambitions. Uh, so that needs to be um, uh, uh, done. And uh, several governmental leaders, including my own Dutch Prime Minister, mentioned maybe we should split the total finance of mitigation and adaptation in a 50-50 manner. And I think that is good. Um, I hope that during this year, towards the COP, we can raise the money, allocate the money, both on mitigation and adaptation, and like I said, work out concrete best practices because climate change is a reality today. And therefore, the solutions need to be implemented for people today and obviously for generations to come. And I think this, this journey could continue mitigation and adaptation in parallel, hand in hand, into a mitigation. Uh, and Alok Sharma knows very well the race to net zero, reducing strongly our emissions, and an adaptation to make ourselves resilient to the race to full resilience. And I think there is also um, 
um, a moral, a humanitarian uh, obligation also from the richer countries to support in this respect the poorer countries for whom climate change impact is a reality every single day. And that was, I think, the main breakthrough of yesterday that so many governmental leaders said, we are behind that, we will do that, we will invest in that, we will develop the best practices for this and the next generation. Race to net zero, race to resilience. Thank you, Fika. That's a very good way of putting these hand in hand, isn't it? The race to net zero, which has really caught on over the past 12 months, and the race to full resilience um, together, and with that 50-50 proposal of the, uh, of, of the financing. Um, I'd very much like to welcome, and you can probably see him on your screens, um, His, His Excellency Jinjiro Koizumi, who's the Environment Minister of Japan. Welcome, sir. Um, we'll come to you in a second. Um, but just this link that, uh, uh, Faika, you mentioned about the private sector as well, uh, maybe we can turn to uh, Rebecca Marmot, uh, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer, as I mentioned, for Unilever. Rebecca, um, Unilever is a leader in the net zero. Uh, you committed for net zero emissions in all Unilever products by 2039 latest, which is an incredible and exciting uh, 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 goal. And here we're talking about climate adaptation at the same time. Uh, is, this a, is this a thing that uh, um, large companies like, like yours have to think about and, and tackle? And are there examples of the sorts of ways you go about these sorts of issues? Over to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, it, it is, Dominic, as you say, it, it is something that we are spending huge amounts of time trying to, trying to tackle. Climate change is obviously impacting a business like ours right the way across the value chain in, in numerous different ways, from how and where we're growing and sourcing raw material, the direct manufacturing, the people and the communities that we're serving around the world, how, how they use our products. So we've had to try and tackle that in a multitude of, of different ways. You talked very briefly about some climate commitments that we made last year. There's, there's two medium-term emissions reduction goals underneath that 2039 goal that you mentioned, uh, one around reaching zero emissions across our operations by 2030, and the one that you talked about by 2030 uh, right the way uh, uh, across the GHG footprint of all of those products. But of course, we can't tackle that just in isolation. We've also, at the same time, made targets around deforestation free supply chains, really thinking about how do we work with a new generation of farmers and smallholders through what we're calling our regenerative agriculture code. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. And then specifically on water, water stewardship programs for communities that we're working with around the world. And, and of course, uh, Dominic, with the work that you're doing uh, on the WRG, on the Water Resources Group. But I think if I just particularly talk about that area of adaptation to climate change that is about better water management. So across the world, we all know, many of the people on this call, over 70% of the fresh water is used around the world for agriculture. And a lack of water is reducing yields, it's reducing crop, crop, crop quality, it can destroy a whole harvest, which has a terrible impact, especially for the smallholder farmers. So water scarcity for us is a massive challenge for farmers in a lot of the countries where we're sourcing our crops. And we see that becoming even more volatile where we're seeing raising temperatures, more frequent droughts, unpredictability around rainfall patterns. So when I look at how can we help farmers in the supply chain to adapt to that? How can we use water more efficiently to improve crop, crop yields? So we're focusing specifically at the moment on water scarce countries and thinking about very water intensive crops, for example, like tomatoes. So a couple of examples in South Africa, our canal brand are working very closely now with smallholder farmers on a number of different uh, approaches to better cultivate herbs using less water. We're doing that in partnership with WWF in the Drakensberg area. And I think through good governance, improved land management, we can then help to replicate that program around the world. I think on regenerative agriculture specifically, we're about to publish some new guidelines for our suppliers on how to deliver better outcomes around nourishing soil, thinking about increasing biodiversity, improving water quality and, and, and climate resilience. Now, just one other brief area I just wanted to mention is how do we use innovation so that we can help to change our products and so that they're better able to be used by communities around the world who are impacted by this. So we need to think about how through research and development can we make products that provide the same kind of performance but they use less water 
or even, unfortunately, poor, poor, poor quality water or perhaps even no water quality at all. So we've done a lot of work into looking at things like showering habits. How can we help work with scientists to help consumers save energy and water? We know in our value chain, around 95% of GHG emissions associated with our, our shampoo, soaps and, and shower gels, things like that, come from people using hot water, especially the showers. So that kind of research that we're doing helps us understand what the catalysts are for, for changing people's behaviours. So I'll give you, you know, a couple of examples. In laundry, for example, we found that people often use a lot more washing detergent than they actually need so by creating a, a very positive concentrated detergents and things like We make it easier for people to use the correct amount. And in the world, consumers are willing to collect We've developed products now that kill the amount of foam that comes out in the wash. So, for example, you might only need to use one bucket of water instead of three. So I think that, that risk-based approach um, encourages policymakers to, to consider a whole range of different future conditions. Um, adaptation can't be, shouldn't be, undertaken in an isolated way. We really need to think about it in a very joined up and, 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 and integrated way. So I, just to end, I, I'd echo Fiker's words. Thank you to, to Alex Sharma for his leadership. Um, and as we go forward to, to the autumn, we're really looking forward to working with, with Alex Sharma, with others in the public and the private sector and governments so that we can have a successful COP26. Rebecca, thank you very much. It's fascinating to hear some of those very specific examples uh, where organisations, companies such as yourself, are really getting into the, the weeds, so to speak, of how to build up from the specific to the more general. Um, Alec, we'll come to you in, in a second, but with um, uh, Kwaizumi-san, perhaps we can bring um, him in first, uh, uh, because, um, uh, Minister, uh, Japan really is a leader when it comes to climate adaptation, preparedness and disaster risk reduction. Uh, you were the catalyst of the Sendai framework of disaster risk reduction um, in Japan in 2015, which was endorsed by all of the United Nations parties, a bit like a Paris Agreement for, for risk reduction and, and disaster preparedness. So perhaps you are able to share some perspectives from your side on how Japan is tackling the rising impact of climate change. And from listening to the analysts, what you need to see in terms of the adaptation agenda um, for 2021. And then we'll move on to you, uh, Alok Chama, as the COP president. Um, Minister Kwazumi, over to you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, let me express my respect to the host of this closing session, the government of the Netherlands and the World Economic Forum. Uh, last year became yet another sobering reminder that adaptation is urgent. Extreme heat, wildfires, torrential rain, these disasters and the damage they bring know no borders. Redesigning of our socioeconomic system, therefore, is definitely needed. Now, let me answer the two questions one by one. Japan is one of the few countries with dedicated law on adaptation, as we recognize. Adaptation requires the whole of government approach. That means embedding the adaptation perspective in every relevant policy. Even the Ministry of Defense takes part in the governmental council on adaptation because adaptation is also a matter of national security. Mr. Warren, you mentioned disaster risk reduction. Here, our strategy is to enhance the synergy between climate action and disaster risk reduction. I call it adaptive recovery. It is about resilience measures that take into account adaptation needs. It includes the control of land use for communities to better adapt to climate change. Let's not forget, develop, developing countries need support in their adaptation efforts. Japan is working on this front too. At G20 Environment Ministers meeting in 2019, Japan established a science-based knowledge platform on adaptation called AP Plus that helps enhance the country's, uh, the country's coping capacity. Going back to the other question on the private sector, Adaptation can be a risk or an opportunity for businesses. With this in mind, the government collects and shares best practices of adaptation to support the private sector. 
both in avoiding supply chain risks and in creating new business opportunities. Talking about businesses, by the way, Japan counts the highest number in terms of the TCFD membership and ranked second in the world and first in Asia in its commitment to science-based targets. Last but not least, let me draw your attention to the progress in our mitigation efforts. Japan's new Prime Minister Suga announced in his policy speech that Japan will become carbon neutral by 2050. We will write a carbon neutrality goal into law to ensure legal grounds, credibility, and policy continuity. He also pledged to make all new car sales to be electric by 2035 through doubling EV incentives on certain conditions. Tokyo's EV target is even more ambitious. It's 2030. Furthermore, our discussions on carbon pricing have started in earnest. Besides that, we will submit a bill on plastic resource circulation to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. Japan plans to have a round table on circular economy, CE Davos, together with the World Economic Forum in March. This will be an excellent venue for showcasing various efforts toward the circular economy. Minister Sharma, let's join forces for a successful COP26, and together, let's redesign our socioeconomic system beyond COVID-19. Thank you very much. Arigato. Arigato, um, Minister Koizumi. Thank you so much for that. So, um, Alex Sharma, COP26 uh, president, we've heard from the science, we've heard from the Commission on Adaptation with some pretty good ideas on uh, policy and, and directions from the leaders in the private sector and from a leading party, as they say in the United Nations, a leading government who's working on these issues. Um, perhaps some food for thought there in terms of the adaptation dimension to the COP26 uh, meeting. Over to you, sir, for your thoughts and reflections. Great, Dominic. Well, thank you uh, very much for, for chairing this event. Of course, huge thanks to the World Economic Forum and uh, the, the Netherlands for organizing this panel. And then, uh, some really brilliant contribution there from my fellow panelists, incredibly insightful. Uh, and uh, I think everyone uh, acknowledges universally that uh, uh, this year, 2021, is absolutely going to be a critical year uh, for climate. Uh, and I've said this before, and I, I will never tire of repeating this, that I want to see the, the golden thread of climate action woven through every international event on the road to, to Glasgow. Uh, and um, at the Climate Ambition Summit, which we, we co-hosted, the UK co-hosted with um, uh, the UN and France uh, last December, we had uh, 75 world leaders coming forward making very concrete commitments. Um, at that point, I set out uh, four key priorities for uh, COP26. So the first was to secure this a step change in emissions reductions, which we, we all want to see. Uh, secondly, to strengthen adaptation. Uh, and, and this is about ultimately protecting people and nature. Uh, thirdly, to get uh, finance flowing to climate. And, and clearly, that is both uh, public finance, but also private finance. And fourth, to enhance the international cooperation that we have uh, around the globe on this, this particular area. And that has to be uh, amongst policymakers. It was great to hear uh, my friend, uh, Minister Koizumi, uh, setting out what the Japanese government is doing. And I want to thank him for the very good collaboration that he and I have had over the past year, which will obviously continue uh, uh, this year as well. Uh, obviously, investors need to be part of that. Businesses, society, we had some great examples, concrete ex examples there from Rebecca about uh, what the business that she represents uh, is doing in fighting uh, climate change. Um, but I want to just focus on the last three priorities, uh, if I may, uh, in, in this particular session, uh, and, and how they, they work together, how they meld together. Look, the reality is we all know that um, uh, climate change, uh, the effects of that, the very severe effects, uh, effects of that are, are very much uh, with us. We heard from, from Petri, who set out uh, you know, where we are in terms of global warming uh, at this stage. So it is um, absolutely vital that we go further and faster on adaptation. And we need to build this resilience uh, into our societies and our economies. It needs to be completely woven into that. And, and ultimately, of course, that will require all of us to act. So whether we are representing uh, governments or, or, or businesses or investors or, or indeed cities or, or indeed civil society, 
uh, we all have a uh, role to play. Um, and the, the human case, Fika talked about this, the economic case for this is absolutely overwhelming. Uh, and we know, uh, as we've heard, that the most vulnerable are at the greatest risk from climate change, uh, and in fact, those who have done the least uh, to cause it. Uh, time and again, you've, you've heard it from my fellow panelists, uh, we've seen the devastation, the human misery that's racked by storms, by droughts, by rising sea levels. Uh, and we know that without sufficient actions, millions will lose lives and livelihoods, and very many more people will be pushed, very sadly, into poverty. We, we've heard from, uh, from uh, the, the Global Center for Adaptation, from, from FICA's organization, that every dollar that is spent on adaptation will yield between two and 10 times that in avoided costs and damages. Uh, the economic case uh, for this is very clear. So what I'm uh, uh, doing is calling on leaders in all sectors to up their ambition uh, and, and indeed action on adaptation. I'm urging all countries to come forward with ambitious uh, adaptation plans and communications. The UK, of course, did that at the Climate Ambition Summit in December. And I'm encouraging all governments to align their recovery packages with the Paris Agreement and, of course, with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as well. I'm asking businesses and cities and society and more to join that Race to Resilience campaign, uh, which we, we, we launched uh, yesterday, and it's about increasing ambition and resilience across the whole of society. Um, uh, just to give some examples from a, a UK perspective, um, in terms of the practical solutions that uh, we are supporting in, in finding for adaptation. So, of course, we had the launch of the Adaptation Research Alliance last week. Uh, we are um, uh, you know, very, very pleased to be supporting uh, Life AR, uh, which, as colleagues will know, is a program led by the, the LDCs, by the least developed countries, to aid their adaptation, because we are committed to adaptation being locally led. I think that's really very important, and to making progress faster through international cooperation. You'll have heard yesterday uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson launching the Adaptation Action Coalition. He's done that together with our partners, Egypt and Bangladesh and Malawi, St. Lucia, the UN, and of course, our friends in the Netherlands uh, as well. Uh, and critically, uh, we are also working with donors and development banks and private investors to get adaptation resilience finance flowing faster and stronger, particularly to developing countries. So we've got organizations like the Coalition for Climate Resilient uh, Investment, for example, and through that we are encouraging investors to take climate risk into account in every decision uh, that they make. Uh, last year, we launched an initiative to accelerate investment in adaptation resilience through the development finance institutions, and I would certainly urge all DFIs to uh, join that particular initiative. And I'm also urging donors to significantly increase international climate finance commitments and ensure a balance between adaptation and mitigation. You've heard that from my fellow panelists. I, I very much back that call. Um, and so what we need to ensure is that not only do donor countries honor that totemic $100 billion pledge a year of money going to climate finance, but adaptation should no longer be regarded as a poor cousin to mitigation when it comes to finance flows. I think that's absolutely vitally important. And it's a point that, that FICA made uh, in terms of what we've been hearing uh, at this, this conference. So I do believe that if we can get finance moving, if we work together, if we can have the ambition and the support to act, we can increase the scale and the pace of our adaptation. And by doing that, we will protect our people, we will protect our natural environment, and of course, our economies as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, the Right Honourable Alok Sharma. <laughs> COP26 uh, president. We'll be hearing more from you a little bit during the Davos Agenda week as well. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, we are delighted to be co-hosting uh, this session um, in the Davos Agenda uh, with the Climate Adaptation Summit as the closing session of the Climate Adaptation Summit. And technology permitting, I'm hoping that we can connect over to Sasha de Boer, 
who joins us yes. from the studio yeah. in The Hague. Thank you, Dominique, and thank you, panelists. Uh, I am indeed your co-host, Sasha de Boer, joining from the Summit Studio in the Netherlands. And this was the official closing session of the Climate Adaptation Summit 2021. The summit seeks to accelerate adaptation action all around the world by inspiring change, showcasing best practices and tangible adaptation solutions. As you know, COVID-19 has transformed the landscape of our society and poses both threats and opportunities for the climate adaptation agenda. Climate adaptation is at risk of serious setbacks in the coming years due to shifts in public spending, due to the immediate relief and the potential fallout of a global recession. Yet adaptation has never been more important. Climate shocks are happening now, intersecting with and worsening impacts of COVID-19. Therefore, building resilience to climate impacts will be critical to response and recovery efforts. The Climate Adaptation Summit sought to accelerate climate adaptation, and it's vital that we keep the momentum going beyond this summit. During the summit, partners from all around the world presented their adaptation efforts and their commitments towards the future. Their efforts, our joint efforts, will be captured in the Ad Adaptation Action Agenda and shared with the summit participants, all of them. The Adaptation Action Agenda will provide insight into infor efforts from around the world, strengthen cooperation and facilitate progress monitoring. You and I will probably get back to work tomorrow, but within our, com within our communities, our cities, our countries and our regions, and we will continue our adaptation action. And we will meet again at COP26 and other international events to showcase progress and share lessons learned. Thank you for participating in this co-host session from Davos Dialogues and the Climate Adaptation Summit. At the summit, we'll continue at Channel One with the final cast talk on the way ahead with Frans Timmermans, Patricia Espinosa, Marta Delgado and Tracy Fung. Please join us for the final word by our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. Ladies and gentlemen, first, first let, me let me thank you all for your contribution to the Climate Adaptation, Adaptation Summit. Summit. We're completely, We're completely online, online, all in different locations, locations, but with one common goal, to adapt as well as we can to the reality of the changing climate and to turn our ambitions into adaptation action. And this action is essential because climate change can be seen and felt all over the world. And also because, as COVID-19 has shown, in order to deal with risks, it's crucial that we show resilience and that we do so together. And we have the opportunity to act now, but we are running out of time. Last year alone, governments around the world invested more than $10 trillion in crisis relief. This accumulated debt may reduce the ability of governments to address urgent needs. And yet, so far, most stimulus packages have not adequately built climate resilience into their recovery plans. This needs to change. Because investing in climate adaptation brings many advantages in a broad range of areas. It creates jobs, protects communities and ecosystems, and promotes sustainability in a changing world. So investing in adaptation is simply the smart thing to do. And with that in mind, it's great to see the enormous spectrum of plans, ideas and initiatives that have been presented in the last 24 hours. Like the inspirational example of early movers Ghana and Bangladesh who are making their infrastructure climate resilient. And a fantastic initiative aimed at offering 1 million young people from the Global South a free adaptation course and so involving them actively in climate adaptation. We have bundled all these initiatives into the Adaptation Action Agenda 2030, which will help guide us towards a climate resilient future by 2030. The current pandemic poses extra challenges, but it also gives us a chance to build forward better, to build forward to a world that's more resilient, sustainable and inclusive. Let's seize that chance together with each other and together for each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha de Boer from the Climate Adaptation Summit, and good luck with the uh, final uh, discussions there, and from Prime Minister Ruta. Uh, back with the panel, I'm delighted to say, and probably no surprise to you as panellists or to you as viewers, we've had 
millions of questions that have come in uh, about this uh, topic. Um, I'm going to, if I may, just offer a few up and um, uh, to the uh, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, um, Patrita, here's a, here's a sort of science question. It's from a chap called Rupert Howes, who many of us uh, might know. Thank you, Rupert, for your question. Uh, has humanity just left it too late, given the positive feedback loops to keep warming below 1.5 degrees? Realistically, what can we do? What can be achieved if we do everything now? Is it too late, uh, Secretary General? I, I, I think that this IPCC report that was published two years ago was demonstrating that uh, for the welfare of uh, mankind and our planet, it would be uh, very important to aim at uh, reaching these 1.5 degrees. And, uh, and, and this good news that we have heard from the European Union, from China, Japan, uh, South Korea, South uh, Africa, and uh, more recently from, from USA, is yeah, they are positive news, and we should uh, aim at getting also other countries on board. So they're still theoretically possible to reach 1.5, uh, and uh, there's a good chance to reach the, the limits of Paris Agreement, 1.5 to 2 degrees. That's what I understand. Um, it actually, it's one of those moments where we could just do this, given the level of commitments that are coming in and inching us down towards the Paris Agreement and maybe beyond 1.2 uh, towards 1.5, which makes the COP summit so exciting in a way um, at the end of November. This could be one which we can just do with the leadership that is being displayed from the public and private sectors. Rebecca, and maybe to an extent, um, uh, FICA, given your sectors, Here's a question about the food sector. How can the food sector be engaged in a more resilient direction, e.g. food security and vulnerable livelihoods, but also food industries in the global north? We've heard a lot about the food sector. You, you gave us a few examples, Rebecca, but maybe, um, you know, what are, what are you seeing in the food industry more generally? Is there a, is there a movement towards uh, a net zero, more resilient food systems? Um, and maybe if I could, some thoughts from you as well, because you, you, you work in the innovation side of this agenda as well. But Rebecca first. Thanks, Dominic. Well, of course, there's the, the UN Food Systems Summit uh, that is coming up this year, which looks to tackle the issues around how does the food industry ensure that they have the right steps in place to protect against climate change. I talked a little bit about the work that we're doing on regenerative agriculture practice. So working with smallholders, working with farmers around the world to think about how can you grow and cultivate crops in, in a more positive way. Some small tangible examples of things that we've been working on. One I think is a big shift uh, in dietary habits. We made an acquisition last year, the vegetarian butcher, and we're seeing a huge move now towards plant-based, which of course uh, better in terms of, of, of thinking about deforestation, but also in terms of eating more healthily. Uh, last year, we, we made a big announcement with the WWF through Cunora around future 50 foods. So actually, how can we encourage greater dietary diversity so stopping consumers around the world, all of us, eating the same foods all the time and having an over-reliance on those key crops? So actually, by including greater diversity of fruits and vegetables in the diet, thinking about different sorts of grains, move to plant-based that I talked about before, I think we can make some important moves towards changing the reliance on those same key areas. Um, and then I think lastly, I talked a little bit, Dominic, in my, in my uh, words earlier about the importance of thinking about water management in the most effective way. So how can we think about drip irrigation? How can we think about better water management when, when we're growing our crops and commodities? Thank you, Rebecca. Fika, what are your thoughts on this sort of resilience, if you like, in the food system, and particularly in the food industry in, in the north, shall we say? Well, it counts for all uh, food production, uh, maybe the south first. I mean, uh, climate change is impacting more Africa and certain Asian countries at this moment than it does uh, the north. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, bad because the south did not cost it. Uh, and that food production needs to be resilient by local production, by helping uh, to have different seeds which can survive droughts or survive floodings, uh, different agricultural methods. Um, in, in Kenya, now they work with uh, apps uh, that help the farmers how to fertilize and how to uh, deal on the weather, etc. So there are all kinds of technologies uh, on, on growing the crops um, and, and that 
make it more resilient in, in an adverse climate situation. Um, droughts, flooding, seeds, fertilizers, all that stuff. And a project like African Proof Foods is very much supporting this with the African Development Bank local production. But also for companies like Unilever, or our company or other companies who are dependent on all kinds of food supply chains, uh, you better prepare and, and realize how whether their supply chains are resilient and otherwise at once you will be confronted um, uh, with some hiccups or some issues. By the way, I also think that companies should be more transparent about that towards their shareholders, towards the media, towards the outside world. What is the risks, uh, DC? And maybe also embrace the TCFD uh, framework uh, for this. The good thing is also, uh, next to all the, the problems, Dominic, that there's a lot of technologies, or a lot of solutions also. So I would like to end also on a positive note on this. Um, uh, we are smart enough to develop solutions as well. And that is in adaptation very important, not only to prevent, but to find solutions for the problems. <coughs> and they are. They need to be financed, like uh, Minister Sharma said, but uh, they need to be developed. The private sector can play a role, but they are available. Thank you. Um, and then the final word uh, for this closing session of the uh, Global Adaptation Summit to you, Alok Sharma, is COP26 present. You'll be pleased to know, sir, that um, the questions and comments that we're getting in, um, there's, there's so much support for a breakthrough. Like, we want this to happen. What can we do? How do we get involved? Um, lots and lots of comments like that. So um, we're all rooting for you, it seems, around the uh, uh, community who've been watching this uh, uh, session. But in particular, there's a couple of questions which are really about how can that ambition, both on resilience and on tackling the greenhouse gas emissions, how can it be unlocked? How can we help? Um, what is your ask to those companies and those financial institutions and, and communities generally to, to get involved? It's so important and there's such a groundswell of wanting to help. Um, and people are we're interested to know what your, what your kind of uh, 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 remarks to them would be, how to get involved, what can people do? Great, Dominic, thank you very much for that. And look, I'm absolutely delighted that um, so many people are willing us forward uh, to have a, a year where we're going to actually make a real difference when it comes to tackling climate change. And uh, as I said in my, in my uh, uh, remarks uh, as part of the panel, is that uh, this is on, on, on all of us. Uh, at the end of the day, if we are successful this year, that success will belong to each and every one of us uh, in playing uh, a part. Uh, I mean, you raised the issue about uh, businesses and investors. Uh, I mean, clearly their role is is absolutely vital in that. I mean, you've you heard from from uh, from Rebecca from FICA in terms of uh, what businesses are, are are practically doing already. So, I mean, it, it is uh, uh, you know the work that's going on in developing resilient agriculture. You've heard about uh, the, the the work on crops that, that that's happening, um, and actually I I infrastructure as well uh, is is absolutely vital. Making sure that we have resilient infrastructure as well around the, the world, and then providing those technical service and assistance, uh, particularly in developing countries, which is uh, going to be so vital. Uh, I mean, if you look at what businesses can do right now, um, we, we made reference to that during the panel session, but um, uh, the, the UN climate champions for, for climate action, uh, uh, Nigel Topping for the UK and, and Gonzalo Munoz, uh, for, for COP25 uh, have been doing a, a brilliant piece of work. And I want to pay tribute to them uh, for the work they've done through uh, the Race to uh, Zero campaign. Uh, we've got a significant number of companies that have signed up to that, committing to uh, net zero by 2050 on science-based targets. And of course, those companies also working, bigger companies working with their supply chain and supporting them uh, to uh, sign up and, and to, to aim for reducing their emissions uh, as well. And the other uh, uh, big initiative which was launched uh, yesterday was this Race to Resilience uh, campaign. And th this is about pulling together non-state actors, uh, uh, businesses, of course, as part of this, to improve the, the resilience to climate risks. And we're talking about uh, supporting uh, 4 uh, billion people uh, in, in vulnerable groups and communities by 2030 around the world as part of this uh, initiative. I, I talked uh, uh, briefly about uh, the work that, that we are doing uh, through uh, COP26 uh, on uh, um, uh, climate resilience, so the, the CCRI uh, work that's going on, which you know is a private sector investment. Uh, but again, it's showing the private sector coming forward. We've got 
62 institutions representing over uh, $10 trillion uh, who are uh, developing and testing practical solutions uh, when it comes to transparent risk pricing uh, as well. So, um, you know, th th there is a huge amount that is going on in terms of the private sector. Uh, and I think this is a, a question of us supporting uh, each other, policymakers, uh, supporting uh, uh, the business community, uh, the wider civil service community. Uh, and I do think if we continue to do that this year, uh, then I hope uh, we will be able to achieve something that we all of us are, are very proud of by the end of 2021. Thank you so much, Alex Sharma, president of the COP26. Um, we're all here with you to make this work. So uh, thank you for those uh, kind words. Rebecca Marmot, Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever. Shinjiro Kozumi, the Environment Minister of Japan. Faiku Sabizma, Honorary Chairman of Royal DSM, Chairman of the Global Commission on Adaptation. Professor Pateri Talas, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. Our friends and colleagues with the Government of the Netherlands, um, who have been hosting the Global Adaptation Summit, and of course, our colleague and friend, Sasha de Boer, who has been uh, moderating and chairing that. This has been a wonderful discussion um, co-hosted between us and the Netherlands as the closing session on the Global Adaptation Summit. Um, so here from the Davos Agenda in Geneva, on behalf of the fantastic panel um, and our colleagues in the Netherlands, we close the session. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye. <laughs>